Welcome to Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Betsy Singleton Snyder, one of the associate pastors in our church. We are glad to have you here this morning for the TJ and Inez Rainey Lectureship, which was established in 1951 and was endowed by the Rainey family in memory of TJ and Inez Rainey, our consecrated leaders in Arkansas Methodism. We are glad to have Bob and Pam this morning with us. Would you mind standing and let us thank you this morning? We would ask that you please remember to complete the Connect card on your worship bulletin and place it in the offering plates, which are in the narthex in the gathering hall or as you leave for the gathering hall after the service. We would also ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. And it, also at this time, Reverend Sparta uh, comes with a word for our congregation. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Brent Scarter, the senior pastor here at Pulaski Heights, and I want to add to uh, Reverend Snyder's welcome my own to you. Uh, this is a statement that I shared last night uh, at our lecture. It's a statement I will share tomorrow at our worship services as well. So if you are a regular here, you will hear this three times, but it's important that I share it with you. As we gather in this uh, beautiful sacred place on this weekend to celebrate 68 years of the Distinguished Rainy Lecture Series with Reverend Dr. Sam Wells, our United Methodist family is keenly aware of the divisions within our global church regarding the full inclusion of our LGBTQIA sisters and brothers. These divisions became even more pronounced this past week at the call session of General Conference in St. Louis. For any pain this has caused our LGBTQIA sisters and brothers, I sincerely apologize. And I want you to know the doors and hearts of this church are open to all. We are neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. These are more than idle words at Pulaski Heights. We put them into practice every day. We're a diverse community of faith with room for everyone. And not just room, but full acceptance. We embrace you. Since 1912, Pulaski Heights has led this community in speaking out for justice for all of God's people everywhere. Through our broadcast ministry, we serve as a beacon of love and light for people from all walks of life across the state of Arkansas. Our viewers describe us as a refreshing oasis and a place of hope. And this is not going to change at all. The actions of the General Conference are not final at this point. There are rulings to be made and another General Conference coming in 2020. Our leadership here at Pulaski Heights will be meeting to assess the situation and involve you in the process all along the way. Never has the witness of this church been more crucial than it is today. People are watching us, so please remain faithful, remain strong, remain prayerful, remain generous, remain involved. And remember the uh, deathbed words of Methodist founder John Wesley, the best of all, God is with us. And also remember the words of the Apostle Paul, so faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you and God bless.
watched over us as we slept last night. God was there when we awakened this morning. God is in this place among us now. God is in the singing, the silence, the message, and the prayers. As we pass the peace of Christ now, let us worship God. may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the season of Lent is upon us, a path for us to face consciously our mortality with dust and ashes and alms and prayers. We have an opportunity to look with care and attentiveness at the truth about ourselves in the divided world in which we live. It is a world filled with loud, angry, frightened, and hurting people. Lord Jesus, walk with us. You are love made known to a hostile world. You have stared disagreement, derision, and even hatred in the face as you walk toward the cross. Yet your love remains reckless and resilient. Lord Jesus, we need daily help to tell the truth with love in our conversations, social media feeds, political discussions, among our families, and most of all, in our prayers for one another and the world. Let us remember our leaders in the church and the church in all times and places, and the people the church is called to serve everywhere the sick, those in anguish, the impoverished and struggling, many with broken hearts. Teach us again, Lord Jesus, how to center our lives less on ourselves and more on you and your love. Help us to channel your holy and incarnational touch to bring love, healing, compassion, and reassurance to a world that knows little of these, and yet is always welcomed into your presence, where what we really need is always freely given. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
These 68 years of amazing preaching and teaching, called the Rainy Lecture Series, has been a precious gift to this church, to Arkansas Methodism, and to the Christian community at large. The lectureship was endowed by Dallas Pete, Alton, Robert W., and Tom Rainey, in memory of TJ and Inez Rainey, leaders in this church and state. This morning, you have already had, we have a, a, a special blessing, an additional blessing to our um, Rainey preaching series by um, having the St. Martin's voices that you have just heard. How wonderful. They are professional um, vocal ensemble primarily made up of talented past and present choral scholars who come together and um, sing concerts and do special events at St. Martin of the Fields and beyond. They are regular national and international. Uh, they make those tours uh, periodically. And this evening, they will be in concert here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock, so we know you won't want to miss that. They are led by Dr. Andrew Iris, who is the Director of Music at St. Martin in the Fields. He is a graduate of the Royal College of Music and Imperial College London and holds a PhD from the University of Manchester. And again, we are blessed uh, to have them. And now I have the honor and privilege of introducing our 2019 lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. Sam Wells fills many roles, preacher, pastor, professor, writer, those are just a few, brilliant yet humble. Reverend Dr. Wells is um, giving us much to ponder this weekend for these difficult days of the 21st century. Walter Brueggemann, a former Rainey lecturer, gives high praise for Reverend Wells. And after hearing him today, I'm sure that you will agree. Reverend Dr. Wells is a gift to the Christian community and to us this weekend. Thank you, Sam. Uh, well, thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, thank you to Reverend Scarda for the welcome, for the uh, invitation, and thank you to the Rainey family uh, for this endowment, which makes this weekend possible uh, for us all. And, and thanks for letting me bring my friends along, <laughs> because believe me, you didn't want to hear me sing. <laughs> it. Um, it's very good of you to come out on a Saturday morning. I know in my own church, no such thing would be possible. People tend to go, uh, go to bed quite late on a Friday night. I, it reminds me of a, uh, a teacher I had when I was an undergraduate who, uh, who said, I was, in, I was in church the other day, and I think I, I must have nodded off. And then I became aware that somebody was speaking. And then I realized that it was me. <laughs> so uh, we do tend to go back to bed quite late on a Friday night in England. Um, I hope you won't nod off, and I promise that I won't either. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A lot has been said in the last few days about same-sex relationships. But most of these discussions assume that we know what the family and marriage are. I'm not so sure we do know what the family and marriage are. So today, rather than go over familiar ground about same-sex relationships, I want to revisit the territory we perhaps thought we knew. I'm going to start with the family. Of all the things to say about the family, only three, by my reckoning, are uncontroversial. The family is a good thing, is basic to human existence, and is, in some largely undefined way, under threat. 
I'd like to explore what the family shows us about society, about the church, and about God. Let's start with society. The institution of family that so many lament in decline was largely invented in the 19th century. Prior to 200 years ago, marriage was learning to love the person you lived with. In the last 200 years, marriage has been learning to live with the person you once decided you loved. (laughs) For most of human history, the household was an economic unit. Most industries were cottage industries, and the primary purpose of the home was as a center of production. Reproduction, certainly, but the production of goods for consumption and sale almost universally. Spouses, children, grandparents and servants all lived and worked together, and there weren't a lot of doors you could close to have space or time to yourself. The reason for having children was to provide more hands to assist in production and to offer care for parents who passed into post-productive old age. Desire, intimacy, tenderness and love were secondary to the primary aim of economic sustainability. But the Industrial Revolution changed that radically. It created the breadwinner, who left the home each day to go and do arduous and often soul-destroying work in a factory. It created the distinction between the public realm of labor and the private realm of leisure. It invented the notion of the child as a person too young to enter the public world of work and thus restricted to the innocent sphere of the home. It created the role of housewife as one whose duties were primarily concerned with household management, the rearing of children, and the giving of succor to her weary and heavy-laden husband. It created the nuclear family because anyone outside these three defined roles of breadwinner, housewife, and child had no place in the new configuration of the home. More subtly, it invented the notion of religion as a private, intimate, personal, predominantly female phenomenon, most at home in the household, by contrast with the largely male, non-religious, business-like outside world. By the way, and don't worry, I'm not going to stay in this place for very long, when politicians say the church shouldn't comment on public affairs, They're assuming this domesticated religion with its household gods. It's this relatively recent invention, the industrial household, rather than the family itself, that's under threat, because it no longer reflects the social and economic reality of a critical mass of the population. We're entering a post-industrial era, and the shape of the post-industrial family has not yet fully emerged. There's no reason to be sentimental about the industrial family. It flourished because it met the economic realities and provided everyone with clear roles. But it didn't work for everybody. When you add up the single, the gay, the child at the mercy of parental demands, anger or worse, the suffocated or oppressed housewife, the breadwinner who faced unemployment or career failure, and the infantilized teenager with the body of an adult but the social standing of a child, you're probably looking at a majority of the population. In the last generation, with the changing economic role of women, longer life expectancy, diversifying employment patterns, and looser social taboos around sexual expression and divorce, the always present anomalies and flaws in the nuclear model have become ever more evident. Before we leave the industrial family behind, let's pause to recognize what was good about it. It doesn't take an anthropologist to see how the family comes about. It's pretty much all in the traditional marriage service, which refers to the controlling of natural lusts, the creation of a sphere of companionship, and the nurturing of a safe place to bring up children. Without the family, the boundaryless lusts would result in endless conflict and instability. The isolated individual might be lonely and vulnerable, and the child would be deprived and defenseless. 
When it works well, the nuclear family can indeed be a refuge from a challenging, frightening, and sometimes damaging world. It can indeed be a place of learning and growth in manners and morals, in creativity and wonder, in faith and courage. It can indeed be solid emotional ground where the priceless qualities of trust, confidence, self-acceptance, tolerance, and forgiveness can develop and deepen. The nuclear family isn't something one can idly discount. It's the scene for most of our deepest feelings. It's the context for many of the greatest damage. It's the garden for most of our profoundest love. It's the source, perhaps more than any other environment, of countless analogies. It's the reason in the face of loss or betrayal for our most anguished sadness. I have a cartoon of a therapist's office with a man in a fetal position having somehow climbed up to and perched in the topmost corner of the room. The caption has the therapist saying, So, Mr. Jones, shall we start with your mother? <laughs> that cartoon says everything that's inescapable about the family. Once one has set in place these ground rules about the family, that it's more or less basic to human existence, that it's a place of profound longing and need and nurture and joy, yet can also be the context of deep hurt and intolerable constraint, and that it's had a number of historical forms among which the industrial model is widespread but not definitive, then it's easier to understand the witness of scripture about the family. And a sometimes confusing witness it is, the Old Testament affirms that family is basic, but is unsentimental about its flaws. Genesis is a litany of sibling rivalry from Cain and Abel to Jacob and Esau to Joseph and his brothers. The story of Abraham and Isaac hardly paints a rosy picture of household as a refuge from the cruel world. Prominent men like Solomon have many wives, and resourceful women like Esther and Bathsheba have to live by their wits to survive. At least the Song of Songs suggests some people were having a good time. <laughs> the New Testament is confusing in a different way. Jesus makes few statements about marriage, taking for granted the social code where the command to honor your father and mother is basic, discouraging casual divorce, and yet denying there is marriage in heaven. But his itinerant lifestyle, his singleness, and his radical reinterpretation of family relationships are, to say the least, a transformation of conventional models. For Paul, singleness is the normal state for disciples, and marriage is a particular vocation for particular circumstances. You can't really call the New Testament family-friendly. The very first time Mary appears in the oldest gospel, Mark, the disciples say, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replies, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Elsewhere, Jesus says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And at the foot of the cross, the central moment in history, Jesus both affirms and transforms the family. Woman, here is your son, says Jesus to Mary. And to the beloved disciple, he says, here is your mother. Now, there are many interpretations of this scene. One of the most helpful is that Mary represents Israel and the beloved disciple represents the church. And here at the foot of the cross, Jesus is saying, Israel belongs within the wider purpose of God, known as the church. But on a personal level, Jesus is recognizing that the conventional family cannot always provide all the security, stability, and endurance we each need. And in the face of tragedy, something beautiful can emerge that turns the love of these two people for Jesus into a new kind of love and care for one another. And this points us to what family means for Christians. It's never going to be heaven. It's never going to be a constant ecstasy of love 
a seamless robe of happiness, a dreamland of intimate and harmonious relationships, bounding from touching kindness to profound grace, to constant affection, to limitless trust. It's never going to be church. It's never going to have the same diversity, the same global reach, or more than glimpses of the same challenge of mission and repentance and witness and encounter. And it's never going to be God. I fear that many exaltations of the family and Christian circles aren't a form of discipleship, but are a turning of the family into a God. Family becomes idolatry when it becomes an end in itself, a good thing that justifies all kinds of bad things, a form of extended selfishness that simply widens the walls of the self a little, but has no goal beyond its own embellishment. Family isn't a god. It's not church. It's not heaven. Sometimes it can be the opposite of all these things. But what it can be, and what it can equally well without all the can be equally well without all the industrial characteristics that have long been thought indispensable, is a training and an avenue into all these things. Family can teach us about the nature of God as Trinity. Every time a couple have a first child, they're rightly anxious about how the dynamics of each of them with the child will alter the existing dynamics of each of them together. They're right, it will. It doesn't necessarily make the relationship less, often it makes it much more. But it always makes it different. The same is true when a new child comes into an existing family. The older sibling will always wonder if it's possible to love just as much when there are more people in the game. Likewise, the Trinity isn't a self-sufficient solo or an exclusive, mutually obsessed duo. It's three, and yet its love is only enriched, multiplied, and deepened by being three, rather than one or two. Envy and jealousy are not endemic to family life. Insecurity and rivalry, favoritism and cliqueness are not inevitable, however common. Family isn't an ossification of perfection, but a constant improvisation on growing and changing identities, needs, and relationships. The Trinity is a constant invitation and inspiration to see how several can still be one without eliding diversity or eroding personality. While the family can indeed help us understand the nature of God, the best thing a family can be is a center for mission. The idea of perpetual domestic bliss is at best a fantasy and at worst a doomed attempt to turn a home into a stockade against all enemies, most of all hostility, hardship and death. At best, a home is a place from which all parties go out to fulfill the call to be fishers for people, to find Christ in the face of the stranger to take up their cross and follow Jesus, to love God with all their heart and mind and soul and strength. And at best, they each return home with something of what they've found, a new believer, an ex-prisoner, a person who is carrying the cross, a person who's suffused with the love of God. And around the table of fellowship, they break bread, meet the crucified and risen Christ, and are renewed in love and service. They live in a triangle of one another, the stranger, and God, and come to understand and relate to each in ever new and deeper ways. Such life doesn't require a nuclear family. It doesn't assume specific gender roles, compliant and submissive children, doting grandparents from afar, or even perfect marriages. It may well include configurations of households beyond that imagined by the conventional breakfast cereal commercial. But it does require sharing and tenderness, mutual forbearance and intergenerational grace, forgiveness and reconciliation, time and trust, kindness and companionship, loyalty and love, 
and an understanding of a common goal far beyond the comfort and indulgence of the individuals involved. And when you have that, you might not yet have a church, but you do have a family. Let's now turn to marriage. I want to explore what I'm going to call the three faces of marriage. The first face of marriage is what we could call face-to-face. It's two people looking at each other, attending to one another, seeing the deep joy and desire and yet fragility and fear in each other's eyes. It's two people tracing the beauty of hair and the curious shape of the nose, the softness of skin and the electricity of touch. It's two people enjoying a whole lot else about each other that we needn't go into right now. The second phase of marriage takes place at a 90 degree angle from the first. We could call it the side by side face of marriage. It's two people getting on with life together. One person taking the trash out while the other loads the dishwasher. One choosing some music while the other lays the table. One clearing the children's toys away while the other reads bedtime stories. One filling out the tax return while the other goes on the web and makes travel plans to go see the family over Thanksgiving. When it's good, it's because the couple have discovered how to make these mundane tasks a different way of making love. The ordinary is interrupted by moments of touch and tenderness as vital as the waterfall of passion. When it's bad, of course, and the tenderness a distant memory, Each of these necessary but sometimes wearisome tasks gets recorded on a silent roster of resentment. The third phase of marriage happens at a further 90 degree angle from the second. We could call it back to back. It's two people who are married, but are doing the other things in life they need to do when they're not around one another. It's all the work and effort and relationships and hopes and fears that would almost all be there regardless of the marriage, and yet are made new and different and meaningful because they exist within the matrix of marriage. When all this is well, this is as much a way of showing and feeling and expressing love as the other two faces. Storing up stories to share, forging an identity that the spouse can be proud of, grasping in one's pocket the memento she gave you last night, quickly calling his cell phone right after he's due to have had that difficult meeting. But when all is not well, there are lingering suspicions that formulate around the seldom articulated conclusion, work is where you go to get away from me. Here's the bad news about marriage. I've never known a single couple who are perfect in all three of these faces. We have euphemisms for the ways people discover their frailties. One is, they had a passionate marriage. I suspect this means they were pretty intense about number one, face to face, but they never quite worked out how to translate that passionate love into numbers two and three, side by side and back to back. You can picture the scene. She's in Chicago all weekend on a conference and calls home to him. Some minutes into the call, she can tell from the background noise he's reading his email while he's on the phone to her. In other words, he's flipped unthinkingly from number one to number three. She's apoplectic with rage. When she comes home, they have no reservoir of side-by-side things to do together to get used to each other again, like cooking a meal or walking the dog. So they try plunging into the intensity of face-to-face. Sometimes it works and the resentment is borne away from the hidden storehouse of anger by the torrent of desire. But oh, when it doesn't work, oh, how the crockery flies and the voices rise in fury. They had a passionate marriage indeed. Another euphemism is, they're such a great couple. To me, this means they've got number two right. They seem to interact seamlessly around the home and amid one another's friendships. So one always feels welcome in their presence, but never questions they have a deeper bond with each other that creates the music for the lesser dances they can animate and enjoy with everyone else. 
They've learned how to be good companions and form a lifelong friendship. But marriage isn't the same as friendship. I wonder how often they're such a great couple is a euphemism for saying, number one, the face-to-face -face has literally gone to sleep. Side-by-side -side is great when there's a lot to do, when the children are demanding and patience and understanding are in high demand. But what about when such a couple dreads going on holiday together, dreads Valentine's Day, wants a dozen other people to join them on their wedding anniversary because they've lost the art of looking into each other's eyes in such a way that nothing else matters? They're such a great couple, indeed. And the third euphemism is, they had an old-fashioned marriage. An old-fashioned marriage, it seems to me, is a way of saying we keep numbers two and three, the side-by-side -side and the back-to-back, -back, very separate. We concentrate on getting the back-to-back -back right because it puts a roof over our heads and supper on the table. We rejoice in big family occasions when all the back-to-back -back endeavor is justified by a public show of ideal side-by-sideness, recorded on grand photographs, appropriately of smiling people side-by-side. -side. In a really old-fashioned marriage, of course, the side-by-side -side activity is entirely done by the woman and the back-to-back -back labor is all done by the man. But to me, an old-fashioned marriage is a euphemism for one in which the number three, back-to-back -back existence, of the couple is allowed to drift off into a sphere so separate from the rest of the relationship and often in practice so much more important than the rest of the relationship that the couple are only really married for part of the time. That's the bad news about marriage. Here's the good news about marriage. You thought I was never going to get there. <laughs> it's not supposed to be perfect. It's supposed to be good. If you're expecting the face-to-face -face and side-by-side -side and back-to-back -to, -back to exist at a perpetual ecstasy of perfection all the time, you'll be making the perfect the enemy of the good. To quote that ancient doctor of the church, Meat Loaf, two, two out of three ain't bad. So, for example, at the outset of marriage, it would make perfect sense if the face-to-face -face was pretty absorbing because added to tenderness and beauty is the elixir of novelty. And it would make perfect sense if the back-to-back -back was going fine because the couple have had separate lives for many years and they know pretty much how to run their life when they're not together. But it also makes perfect sense if the fireworks come in the side-by-side, -side, when one moves into another's home and does things differently, when friends whom they used to see separately now, now only have that one house to meet in, when close relatives who used to receive their regular phone call during the times the two of them were apart now discover there aren't any leisure times when they can get one of the couple all to themselves. So the good of marriage is allowing the joy of front and back to carry you through for a time while you sort out the delicate matter of sideways. Later a couple may find that the long-practiced habits and gentlenesses of side-by-side -side are disrupted by the voracious demands of small children, such that the back-to-back -back feels like a relief from the relentless intensity of home, and the face-to-face -face feels like a luxury item for special occasions only. Then a couple may need to take active steps to ensure that the joy of life doesn't disappear in the haze, and they may need to do whatever it takes to remind one another that face-to-face -face is not a luxury item, but a glorious human necessity. My delight is in you. Is that a sentence any of us could ever go very long without needing to hear? Perhaps at any time, the back-to-back -back may threaten the best of marriages. Your absorption in work or, or the friendships you make away from home can threaten the other faces of marriage at any time. But then you need to remember that side by side, making a home and a life together is work too good and important work, and whatever joy you may find in work is only part of the joy marriage is meant to be for you. So the good news of marriage is that at different times any two faces of marriage can make up for and redeem and restore a third face if that face has for some reason turned blank or gone sour. And the theological news of marriage 
is that the three phases of marriage correspond to the three, three ways we interact with God. We see God face to face, and for a time we may think that's the whole of faith, to have that sense of peace and love and joy in the presence of God. But we also walk side by side with God, happy to be sharing in the companionship of the kingdom, alongside others whom God has called into witness and discipleship and service. And we also live back to back with God, when for short or long periods we can't feel or know God is there, and yet we know it is God alone that makes our hearts sing, and we have committed ourselves to be among God's children, and we know the feeling will come back again because it always has before. The most significant and exasperating thing about marriage is that it's the best analogy for what it means to be face to face and side by side and back to back with God. For Christians, this walk of faith is made incarnate in the central figure of Jesus, fully human and fully divine. Jesus' full humanity is a perpetual warning against what theologians call Gnosticism and everyone else called sentimentality. Let me explain. When it comes to loving God, we'd all like to be overcome by a powerful feeling of wind and fire that blew us away and made God more real to us than anything else. When it comes to marriage, we'd all like to be overwhelmed by a passionate desire that not only flung us into perpetual ecstasy, but also miraculously got the tumble dryer fixed and paid the bills each week. But infuriatingly, God hasn't made faith or marriage like that. In the incarnation of Jesus, God says to us, I'm not sending you a shortcut. The gift of faith and the gift of marriage are not about a dazzling escape from life, but about the heart of life. You will only receive them if you learn the shape of the way I have given myself to you in Jesus. You will only meet my divinity if you see and embrace and imitate my full humanity. This is the gift and the challenge of faith and the gift and the challenge of marriage. You will only meet God and you will only truly meet one another if you do so through recognizing, attending to and offering your full humanity. Show and tell each other your deepest needs, your deepest fears, your deepest failures, and then your deepest hopes, dreams and desires will seem not threats but gifts. Don't feel your face-to-face -face time must be all sweet nothings, but lovingly share with one another those things you don't understand and struggle to love. Make the most of car journeys, for those are the times when side by side you can share what face-to-face -face seems too great to name. And never despair that the worst back-to-back -back aberration can't be redeemed by restorative attention side by side and face-to-face. -face. This is the way God turns water into wine. This is the way God puts treasure in clay jars. These are the three faces of marriage. And our prayer for the married is that God will bless them through these three faces of marriage. And each will bring them closer to one another and closer to God. For we do meet God, but only through our own humanity and only through God's. So, the family and marriage. What I believe we've discovered together through this exploration of the family and marriage is that they're not disembodied ideals whose form and nature has been revealed and decreed for all time, nor are they absolute states that are the epicenter of God's purposes. Instead, they are social and interpersonal states that have changed over the centuries and changed rapidly in recent decades. The way we express our faithfulness to God is not to preserve or suppose some idealized state commanded and demanded, but by humbly discovering in what social arrangements we best embody the nature of God and God's call to offer good news. And that call, like God's faithfulness, is new every morning.
I know you have been blessed this morning by the uh, singing and by the word brought to us by Sam, and we thank you so much. Uh, you'll have another opportunity this evening to hear the voices of St. Martin of the Fields at 7 o'clock in, here in the sanctuary. And you will be able to hear them along with our sanctuary choir in the morning. Uh, as well as Reverend Dr. Sam Wells at our 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock services. So we hope you will join us. And now receive this benediction. Go now in peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.